So I thought I mainly did the little side and also a head of education. So I will love it. Finally got to my first major event within about three weeks of hard work, I should I say. I want to thank my education team as well. Um, I'll be introducing Barty Kanta, who um, has been here before. He's been up and down the country doing flower, has been on tour with multi men, so any fans of multi men have been with him before. Um, he's got Ijazda in four different types of Kirat, so I'd just like to be coming up and doing some Quran recitation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورٍ رَّحِيمٍ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأن إنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العظيم إن الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ولا آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله فقال نبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم القلمات الطيبات الصدقة تسلي السلام عليكم أبوان don't worry, you probably look at me thinking, oh, it's one of those. 
Oh, I have a personality, I promise you. And you all do too. So show me your personality with a better salam. Salamu alaikum, everyone. And hi to all the friends that tagged along because they got pulled along. I apologize on behalf of your mate that dragged you along, but I hope you find benefit. Um, so, oh God, that's my ugly mug up there. Right. <clears throat> that's me, believe it or not. I know. I told them to use my left side, not my right side. And he's scratching at his neck. What does that mean, Chef? Oh, nothing. Okay, bismillah. Okay, so brothers and sisters, firstly, welcome. MashaAllah, welcome to Leeds University. And to some of you, welcome back. It was 2014 when I was sat in this same lecture hall, like many of you, thinking, are they going to judge me? Am I from the right sect? Am I religious enough? Um, does it matter what family I come from? Bet they're all going to be posh. Just a local Yorkshire boy from down the road, from the inner city. And they're all going to be posh Londoners and that's going to look down on me. And that's natural. Judgment is part of our human evolution. It's natural for us to judge. It is natural for us to assume. That's the thing about new beginnings. Now, Brother Omar was very humble in giving his introduction of me. But if you want to understand who I am, I'm not Mufti Menk, I'm not these big shayuk, I'm not our dear Qari, so, you know, I'm not a big name to any of you. And that was done on purpose. I'm just a local person who's dedicated his life to study activism and living real. And I'm sure all of you are dedicated to the same message, to live real, to live authentically, and to live as yourself. But all good things come with boundaries, and all good things come with guidance. We call that the Furqan in Islam. Having something that you can turn back to, tawalla. So you know that as you go on your journey, you're going in the right direction. And that's why every single one of us is here, I hope. Is that why we're all here? Yeah? I'm not in the wrong lecture hall, am I? It's okay, you can speak. Are you all here with the same near? Are you all here with a good near at least? Yeah. No, sisters, I'm not. Don't worry, the fatwa isn't your voice is aura. Are you here with the right intention, sisters? Yeah. No, nope, can't hear you. Yeah. MashaAllah. Brothers, come on. Are you here with a good intention? Yeah. Right, so let's move on because I don't like looking at myself and I'm sure you don't either. Next slide, please. To the jinn who's going to click on the next button, inshallah. We have our own ISOC jinn, by the way. This is Muhammad, and he does part time. So, before I start going on and giving my talk, I want to know where are you all from? The first exciting thing about being in an Islamic society or being on campus is I get to meet all these people from around the country. You know, I see many of my sisters from Malaysia, Indonesia, and mashallah, will start advice from the Kibar. I remember there were literally three people from the Far East when I joined, and now there's loads. I remember walking down the engineering building, opening the door. This is when the mechanical engineering building is getting that nice front that we now have. Open the door, because I'm going to get to the philosophy building. Whoa, Iraqis on this side running to the dentistry school, Chinese and Korean students going that way. Oh my goodness, look at the diversity. Should I be, should I, you know, I'm really going to do well at languages here. I'm going to pick up loads of languages, and I'm going to get that for free. Ha! That, that was, by the way, the year when it started to be £9,000. Don't worry. We made dua that it would go down. It wasn't going to go down, it went up. But alhamdulillah, so that was as traumatic to get to know you as it is for you to get to know me. Because we are a jama'ah, we are a community. And you are going to build upon that sense of community in the coming six months. Because if you don't, well, what were you doing? So, this is me eight years ago. Yes, I looked slimmer. Yes, my beard looked exactly the same. Please don't tell me it's the right or long length because I don't know. I was a student here, and my story of being connected to this university is both a trial and a tribulation. But I wanted to put this here because this was the first time it was Muharram, and I was asked, we can't get a sheikh, we can't get a scholar, nobody's picking up. Adam, you look all right with a jubba. Please, could you do the talk? And I thought, well, thank you. I came to Leeds University to because I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Got accepted into Liverpool, got accepted into York, got accepted into Sheffield. And I'll explain why this is important in a minute. But for me, I needed to be close to home. So I came to study political science and philosophy. But I wanted to do a, a humanities year first because I just wanted to look at humanities. But I got on the pulpit and I spoke. 
And that was my first interaction with the ISOP because I was told it's just the place where brothers and sisters come to do halal dating. Half of you were thinking it. I just dare to say it. And when the head sister says, Ustad, you're no longer doing Jummah, please go away. You know why. Allah bless our president. But this was the first time I ever spoke as, an ISO, as a member of the ISOC. And it's been, what, seven, eight years. And throughout the years, I've continued to get involved. And then our wonderful brother Uzair gets in touch with me in January. And he's like, Ustad, we need your help. Can you come back? I'm like, really? And I'm back. And in some capacity, I will be involved as an external person because I know what it's like to be in a bubble. I know what it's like to just go to your studies, go to your lectures, have a few friends and come home. So the first thing I want to say is, Leeds is that city that just doesn't get enough credit. It's, we come from the Ahlul Falah. We are farmers and we have a culture where when you're walking your dog, okay, if there any Malikis in the room, let me off, everybody else, shh. But if you're walking your dog and you're walking past one of us, hey, love you, all right. That's just the Yorkshire way. It's not the prevent, it's not the home office. It's just Yorkshire people being friendly. And that's the beauty of coming to Yorkshire. That friendliness, that warmth, that English that is impossible to decipher. But once you do, you can go back home and make millions saying, I taught English in Yorkshire. Or I studied English in Yorkshire. But that's the place I call home. I live it, I breathe it. And you've come to a city that as a city is bigger than Manchester. As a city, so the greater Manchester area collectively is bigger than Leeds. But as a city, Leeds is bigger. And as a city, we're known as the university city of the north. But as a city, we're also a poor city with lots of challenges. And I'll talk about that. But that was a very important moment for me. And today is about living a legacy. Living every day in the year to come, thinking ahead. I never thought I would stand on the member, and I never ever thought I would have a chance to stand in front of you eight years later and be deemed worthy to talk to you. Wallahu azim By the qasam of Allah, by the wa'ad of Allah, I don't see myself worthy to be stood here. I believe that most of you have the same right, responsibility, and the skill set to stand here. And one of the teachers, Sheikh Andrew Busso, he stood there, a student of Sheikh Akram, and he said to us all, eight years ago, he asked the question, how educated do you think you need to be to be a khatib or to give nasiha? And we all put our hands, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and he's like, no. Understand what are the fardul ain. Build yourself, have a sincere heart, and have good companionship and people you can relate to, and you can stand here and give the same nasiha as me. Eight years later, I stand in the place where my own ustad stood, and I say to you, you are all worth it. You all are God-given creation. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تقويم. I've made you أَحْسَنُ taqweem, God says. I've made you in the best form, i.e. those of us with a disability. Those of us with mental health challenges, those of us who come from broken homes like me, those of us who have gone through hell to be sat there. You know the nights you've had to work to pass those A-levels. You know how you've had to be on the phone first thing in the morning to get a place here. You know what you have had to do to get here. And no one knows your pain. No one knows how hard you've had to work. I bet there's people in this room that have had to fight, literally, thousands of other students to get scholarships to be sat here listening to me. Allahumma barik to you all. You deserve it. But Allah Ta'ala gives you a salute when He says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ I've made you with the tools, the ability, and the means to believe in yourself and do amazing things. Your iman is not complete without believing in yourself. But you can't believe in yourself without believing in one greater than you that believes in you. So we move forward knowing what is the intention that you can make to give advice that penetrates the heart of just one person? You all have the ability and the power to do that because with your personality and your sincerity and your own journeys, you could empower somebody. That is one thing that you could take away from being here. A lot of what I owe in terms of my own skills, in terms of my own work, I attribute to amazing people I met on this campus and at Bradford and the other universities where I was, you're going to meet some amazing people and some people that do your head in. But inshallah, you will not see now, as Rasulullah said to Ali when he handed him a letter, Ya Ali, 
everything has a time and everything has a place. You will not see now how Allah Ta'ala is molding you and growing you and refining you. It will come. Diamonds take time to shine. And so too does your soul. But whatever good you think you have now, be willing to give it. Next slide, please. That was the same that had given to me eight years. All I can do is share that again. Echoes of the past. So where are you in your journey? Where are you mentally and spiritually? Where are you? I said at the start, the judgment feeling of walking into a space like this, I'm not really practicing, I don't really wear hijab. Oh, I haven't got a big enough beard. God, I learned my qalmi and my namaz here and I don't know the rest for the Arabs in the room. There are four shahadatain and there are two du'as that culturally we used to get battered to memorize and if we didn't in our community, you didn't know anything. But there was more to Islam than the six qalmi. In it, boys. The trauma, the trauma. You see this trauma speaking? I'm the Pakistanis, I'm South Asian, I'm from the Punjab historically, so I will make jokes that connect with the South Asian kids, because I was a South Asian kid coming to campus thinking, I'm a bad Muslim, they can look down on me. But that judgment is a natural part of human evolution in the mind. We all judge because we all wish to survive. It is natural to judge, but it's what you do with those judgments. It's how you use those judgments to make something positive happen. So don't look at judgment as a negative. Look at judgment as a motivator. Judgment as a boundary setter. And that is innate with your fitra, your soul. We are not from this world. And we are not for this world long. But our soul is being refined through the body that I see in front of me. You are not your real self in the mirror. The real you is what's inside of you. And everything you say and do is refining or uglying that beautiful part of you that waits to return to Allah. Your body doesn't say, Wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Your soul says, Wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. So how do we refine it? How do we better it? Well, we'll talk about that. This is the beginning of a journey for all of you. And it's the beginning of a journey that you are Nu alayhi salam and you are sailing your ark, you are sailing your ship. And there's going to be problems on that water. Like in the Surah Yasin, which, which talks about the falah. The falah is you and your destiny. The falah is you with all that you think you know. Trying to get through the world. And all the fitnas and the challenges and the judgments are waves bashing against the side of your ship. But like Nu, do you hold tight? Like Nu, do you keep on going? Like Nu, do you look to your loved ones and say, how do I keep on sailing? How do I keep on moving forward? How are you sailing your ship over the stormy waters of the year to come? Next slide, please. The answers are many. But I can say a hundred things to you. Only one or two things are going to go in your heads. These are like the sunnah of Rasulullah. When he used to give an advice, he used to make half his speech about questions. Because you have the capacity and the ability to answer them. And some answers will come. I want to rewind a little bit. We don't all come from the same backgrounds. Some of us have better privilege, whether it be our education, our background, our international status. We all have different privilege, and that's okay. Allah Ta'ala has made us with diversity. But every single one of you is a book. What chapter are you on right now? What chapter is being written this year? What chapter is going to be written in your life? How will the chapter end? You have the pen in your every actions. This is me when I was seven. Twenty years ago, I went through one of the most traumatic experiences in my life. I realized what death was. I'm sitting in my room and my uncle knocks on the door. Son, come outside. Come outside. I go outside thinking, I've done something wrong. It wasn't me who kicked the cat, it was my brother. And he's two. I know. Your daddy Ma's just died. Your grandma's died. Six months earlier, my parents forced, failed for a divorce. My mum had been a victim of domestic violence as long as I can talk. And my father, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. May Allah ta'ala empower him and bless him. We all go through moments in our life when we say and do things that we always regret. 
and regret is part of the journey of Tawbah. وَمَنْ tawalla. Allah says, I love the one who in Surah Tawbah, one of the last surahs, who after they have wronged themselves, turn back to me. And I always get asked on Jummah, I've done X, Y and Z wrong in my life. How could God forgive? It's not the how. It's the maqam of Allah, the status of Allah, that he has the means and the mercy to love you and forgive you, to be wudud and rahim, more than your little human mind could comprehend, because you're worth it, O insan. Because we're worth it. My parents had been through an abusive situation. I used to get knocked about a lot. My grandma's just passed away. And my grandparents have turned their face for my mom. She's a single parent. For those years, I was looking after my kid brother whilst my mom was realizing that her bipolar was real. Stop faking it, love. She used to say to herself in the mirror. I knew she was bipolar, and I couldn't spell the word. She knew she was bipolar. And she used to self-harm. And I remember being 17 and having a conversation with my mom. And I'm like, mom. Do you mind me saying something? I know what you used to do in the bathroom. I know what you were going through. And I'm sorry that I couldn't have been there for you. And she said to me, son, put the... She says, I'd go into that bathroom with a plan. And Khuda would plan, Allah would make a plan. And his plan would always prevail. Because I know what legacy am I leaving? Would I leave behind two orphans? Or am I going to leave behind two men? I learned then, soon after this picture, to think about the legacy I want to leave behind. But how can little old me leave a legacy? Everything I am is because of my mom. Every sacrifice. I know what it's like to go home and to be embarrassed to ask for dinner. I know my human psychology is such that I eat once a day. I don't like eating more than once a day. Because I knew what poverty was like growing up. I knew what it was like to ask my mum. There's some people here who've been listening to my khutbahs for two, three years thinking, we never knew that. I, wallahi, respect and love you all for the sake of Allah that I would share these personal things with you. Because I bet there are people sat in this audience who are at war with the shaitan. Their iman is in doubt. They're worried about how everyone's judging them. Some of you are carers. I came to this university and I was a carer. I used to run for my life. I had no time for a social life. Moments like that last photo was a blessing. My own beloved teacher sat amongst us, Ustala Farah. I was here the year she joined, and I know what war we had to have, what challenge it was to have a Muslim chaplain on campus. And this woman is an incredible woman that you're going to hear from. She should have been the main speaker, not me. And to know that eight years later, she sat there when I was in a suicidal place. I couldn't handle university, and yet I was a student of Sharia. I could translate and speak five different languages. I could quote the verses to you that I bet I'm quoting to you now. And still, the information and the heart doesn't connect. So the first thing I want to say is, even though you know a lot, it takes, now, it takes time for that information to process. Because experience takes time to get into the head and the heart. That's why your soul is in this temporary world for a temporary period of time. It's here to experience. You will experiment. You will experience. God has given you a stamp when he says, you are naturally weak, forgetful. One tarjum or one ma'na of this word, da'afa, is to be forgetful, like Nabi Adam, for there's no sin on Adam. Another interpretation of this word is to be in a state of anxiety. So when you're anxious and worried, it's a natural part of your human evolution. And I say that in the sense of your development. But remember, Ahsanu Taqweem, you have all the tools you need. Sometimes it takes time to unlock them. Sometimes it begins with an act of courage. Speaking out, asking a question, asking a friend, being honest with yourself. How can you be honest with Allah when you can't be honest with yourself? They are the lessons I learned in my trauma from my hero, my mother. And yet I was a carer, a student on campus. This is a park in Hare Hills where I'm from. Look at the arrow, there's Leeds University. I'm an inner city kid from the estate. And I make no judgment on that. We used to stand in that park as kids and make jokes. And I can't make all those jokes because I'm dressed like this and we're in Islamic talk. Oh, can you see that weird looking building on the hill? That's where all the posh kids go. Ah, we'll end up at Beckett or Huddersfield. Amazing universities, by the way. But we're not good enough to go to a Russell group. And those of you Arabs and Asians, 
what your mums and dads say to you because they went through their trauma to get you through your education. So pushing you, pushing you, Russell Group, Russell Group. That's all I had in my head. I'll be the first to go to university. I will prove my relatives wrong that my mother could raise boys that would be decent men. I have to go to a Russell Group. But forget all that. If I am not at the feet of my mother every day, I don't care, I applied to Oxford, I did not even look at the letter to see rejection or acceptance. Couldn't be bothered. The Akadam of Jannah are here. So I stayed local. And it was a dua, day in, day out, to be in this university. So I congratulate each and every one of you for your hard efforts, for what you've gone through to get here. But the show has just begun. The challenges have just begun. You have three, four, five years, not to succeed, but to write a new chapter in your life. A chapter that you can look back to and say, here are some useful lessons, and you will write those chapters. Next slide. It always starts with a jump of faith, a leap of faith into the unknown. Here is a circle. This is what you know. This is what makes you comfortable. When you take a step out of your comfort spot, what do you do to your little circle? You widen it, right? That is where confidence comes from. That's where the realms of being somebody who pushes out of their boundaries. If you stay stuck in one place, you're never going to grow. You're going to get comfortable. Ah, why well, go to uni? I can get a job in my local area. I'll just stay with mum. Staying in my comfort zone. You've already taken that leap of faith and that first step. But which community are you going to build? What is your next step you're going to take? And I start my next bit by saying, when you take your next step, where is Allah in that next step? Where is your and my Rabb in that next step? For he was watching you when you could not speak in your mother's arms. And he is watching you when he sends his angel to take you back to him. Taking that step is courage. And you need courage nowadays to be a Muslim on campus. Rasulullah talked about the coal. He cried for you and he cried for me when he said, there's going to come a time when my ummah will not hold on to their iman like the coal. You know the famous hadith. You are defo, that generation. Me, you, our kids. It's hard to be a Muslim without feeling like you're watching down your religion or feeling like you have to be an ambassador. I was born in 96 when the Bosnia war happened. I was growing up when 9-11 happened, when the local youth centers, one of the bombers was from there, when 7-7 happened in 20, 2005. All my life I've known is Muslims, 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 terrorism, home office, terrorism, apologize, apologize. That's what probably a lot of you, and some of you are just that generation below me. It's hard to be a Muslim, but it begins with a jump of faith. Your soul had to trust in Allah when Allah told his beloved soul, enter the body. Kun fayakun, be so you will become. You've already taken a leap of faith without realizing when your soul entered the human realm. Life is all about leaps of faith. Next up, next slide. So where do we begin? Like my sister said, you begin with the end in mind. Where are you going? What is it that you want to achieve? You and I were brought up being told, career, career, career. And some of our parents have this thing of like, you need to build a career, you need to have a career. But what they forget, oh yeah, then you also have to have deen on the side. Memorize the Quran, become a scholar, get a nice wife and a husband. Don't mix that up, by the way, brothers. You know what I mean. Sisters got it. Mashallah, mashallah, zaki, mashallah. This is, this is the future. I was in Indonesia once, and a great scholar called Shafi Ma'arif said to me, the future of Islam is not with the brothers, it's with the sisters. Empower a brother, you empower a man. Empower a sister, you empower ten generations. I didn't get it at the time. I just thought, oh, okay. I get it now. And like I said, I'm the product of a woman. Not just a product by birth, but a product of mindset. So sisters, you are our future. Everyone looks at you, hijabi or non-hijabi, this is not a thick lesson. Everyone looks at you to define what they think Islam is. You hold such an amazing place. You stand in the footsteps of Aisha, radiallahu anha. You stand in the footsteps of Khadija al Kubra. You stand in the footsteps of the mother of Mary, the best single mother who ever lived. You stand in the footsteps of the wife of Pharaoh who stood up against her own husband and said, La, this is an evil to me to deal with this child. 
How are you going to use your womanhood and that beautiful gift that Allah has given you in your gender to empower not just yourselves, but to empower other women and men? Because the biggest mufti in our ummah when Rasulullah's soul left his body, meaning he passed, was Aisha. When the great male sahaba were arguing about leadership and the bounds of sectarianism is, 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 is created, the people were rallying behind Aisha. And Aisha was directing the people. One of the beautiful things about university is you get to hear stories and do courses and talk about perspectives that might not be comfortable to you. And some of my brothers from Bradford and Huddersfield, though sometimes, because they come from a certain sector school of thought, they'll get concerned or worried. You know, in our local masjid, somebody did Rafa Yadain. Oh my God! Oh my God! They are from the Khawarij. Oh my God! They're doing Rafa Because it's, a Han it's Hanafi and Fiqh, the majority of the community. Oh my goodness! You're eating shrimp! Because again, most Hanafis are a bit mm, when it comes to. But when you were living in Indonesia, it's all good. That is natural. I've seen it time and time again. When you're still stuck in your comfort zone, and you haven't taken the step out, taking a step isn't always a physical move. Taking the step is to listen, and to listen. And let me put a new word in there, and to actively listen. Listen like you care. Because as much as you've got nasiha to give, opinions to give, this is not speaker's corner. As much as you've got nasiha and advice to give, you also have a lot to take from others. So as much as you're giving, are we doing for time? Yeah. As much as you've got to give, no, you don't know it all, and that place of humility is the most beautiful place to be. Like Al Malik said, the best of us are those who say, "Anna arif I do not know," for that saves you from be giving for giving Allah an excuse to put you in the flame, because you shared something that was ignorant or something that was unfair. It's better only asma to say quiet than to speak like you know. But it's equally good to say, "I don't know." What can you give me? Because when you say, I don't know to someone, you're basically saying, what gift can you give me today of knowledge? That's part of building that brotherhood and sisterhood. That's the whole idea of the ISOC. That's the whole idea of learning. So begin with what end in mind. When you finish your three, four years, what's next? Think you've got your 10-year plan with your career. But has Allah come into your 10-year plan? Because even if you build a career, you may not see it. I had a friend at university who passed away before he graduated. Wanted to be an engineer. Wanted to do all these amazing things. Akhil. And, it, and, it, and it's hard to say, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhim. We used to pray together. He used to correct my tajweed mistakes when I used to give the khutbah in the green room. He used to read over my essays even though he was an engineer and I was a humanities student. Uh, you guys just read essays all the time. We do the proper stuff. Hashtag STEM. Allah bless you. You know, we are the leading community when it comes to STEM. And STEM is what's building the Muslim Ummah and the non-Muslim world as well. So, you've got a big responsibility. I'm always jokes and says, when you go and see these students, you're going to be talking to the, the assistants of Muhammad bin Salman and the Grand Mufti of Egypt and the big architects from Dubai. I'm like, alhamdulillah, mum. Hashtag Leeds University. So I'm in, a, I'm in a seat of potentially powerful and wonderful people. Well, you're wonderful, because you haven't hurt me yet. I've thrown tomatoes at me. But you all have so much power and ability. But where does Allah Ta'ala and your relationship with Him fit in you building your professional relationship with everybody else? A question that only you can answer. And knowledge is power. Next slide. So we've all heard about the Ikigai. And that's about all the Japanese that I know. Watashi wa Japan desu. Do we have any Japanese students in the audience? Oh, that would have been so cool. Malaysians and Indonesians, we've definitely got a few of you. Can I get a takbir from you? Takbir. Everybody else, can I get a takbir? <coughs> that was just so that I could breathe, not because I said anything decent, I know. We all learn about this in school, or we're supposed to, or whatever. And this is about... Okay, how do I actually think about my professional development? And remember something, we look at everything with an orientalist mindset. I spoke about being born in 96 with Bosnia and being a kid who grew up with 9-11-7-7 when you lot were being told by your big sisters and your mum and dad about what it was like a few years ago. Well, 
We realise very quickly when we're at university how much of what you know is from an Orientalist perspective. How much of what you know has been watered down, has been made nice. How much of it actually comes from authentic sources? How much of it actually comes from the horse's mouth, from the Qur'an al-Kareem, from the works of hadith? How many of us are, if we don't have a hadith for something, oh my God, it's the end of the world. Abu Hanifa says, what could be better than following a hadith than to find tafsir of Qur'an in Qur'an? And that's a maxim of the Hanafi school of fiqh, which is the largest school historically in a thousand years. But when I say that to a brother of mine who is hadith pure, that doesn't fit in their head. But what have we both done wrong? We haven't made time to actively listen to the other and to realize there is more knowledge and tradition than just what's in our own experience. And that's the beauty of being a jama'ah. You see the experiences of people on the liberal side of the spectrum, the orthodox. Then you say, hang on a minute, how are we defining liberal? How are we defining orthodox? How are we even defining practicing? But we all come back to the same Quran. In your goal setting, Pleasing Allah is what is the first thing because you're going to get your examination but the examination is with the angel Imam Mubin when you are given your book in your right hand and told you actually did your best here it is or the graduation certificate of shaitan when he says ah, I got you, I tricked you haha. <laughs> before Allah Ta'ala disintegrates him because he's been given a promise I hate man with damatul insan as the poem goes I hate this thing of mud this creature of the particles of mud, the dama, from which my name Adam comes from in Persian. I promise you, Ya Rab, give me permission and I will take as many as I can into the place that is ba'idah from you, far from you. Shaitan don't like you. And he don't like discipline. And as you learn with the wax on, wax off in a lot of the great karate movies, discipline builds a person. Structure builds a person. Focus builds a person. Goals build a person. Because life has a funny way of taking you left and right. But you have to start with a goal. So in your goal, what does it mean to be falah, to be successful? Is it simply about graduating? Oh, look at me, yeah, look at me. Don't I look nice with my thing? I never got a graduation photo by the great way. I never went to my graduation. And that's a story for another day. But I'm content. I'm content that I had a certificate to put in my mother's hand, get a kiss on the forehead and be told, right, so when you're getting married and when you're doing your masters, hashtag Asian mothers. Allahumma barik. And that's not my mum being a mum. That's my mum saying, yeah, you're still alive. One of my teachers used to say, Shikatunu, as long as you are breathing, every breath is a reminder that Allah is giving you opportunity to carry it on, to move on to the next goal. So just because you've achieved a year, what is the next year looking like? Just because you're doing well with your grades, what's next for you? What are the goals that you're setting yourself? Because as long as you're breathing, as long as you're smiling, that's your body indicating, being an ayah for you. You have opportunity to do so much more. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ I come back to the ayah. You have been given the tools to become the best ahsant version of yourselves. But that begins with believing in yourself and pushing yourself. But not too much. So with the akigai, what's the problem? I'm looking at this with my western mindset and thinking, okay, this is cool. What am I going to do with my knowledge from Leeds University, my profession, my vocation? Or to put it in simple language for those of us who are a bit slow with comprehension like me. How am I going to get paid? What am I going to be good at? What am I going to enjoy? What am I going to love? The thing missing from that is, how is that going to prepare me for accountability, Yom al-Hisab? How is that going to feed my soul, the real part of me? Like we say in the madrasa to the kids, your ru is the real you. Can you say that with me? Your ru is the real you. You're so boring, people. Mas, I, your ru is the real you. And English is his fourth language, just saying. And that's a good friend of mine, by the way. I'm not being racist, I promise. So, brothers, your ru is the real you. Your ru, there's that many hufas in this room. Come on. Your, if the sisters do a better job, brothers, I gave you a chance. Your ru is the real you. Your ru. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. Sisters, what is the real part of you? Your? I have to help my sisters out for the sake of Allah. Because also the president's sat on that side, so I need to be on the president's good side. And Umar, yeah, Allah bless him. This brother, mashallah, has done such a good job. And all of you guys in ISOC, the mantle on your head, you don't have positions and you don't have power. 
you have so much responsibility on your heads. The mental health and well-being and the care of these students is partly your responsibility. But remember yourselves in your responsibility. Remember your own rights, but remember the way you love each other and work together with respect is going to make us a beautiful, powerful Jamaat. And year in, year out, different ISOCs have had to contend, like my Ustada knows, with different challenges, different problems. But it's that trust in the Ummah, in each other, that will help you through. The first trust is tawakkal Allah, then tawakkal ilal jama'ah. Trust in Allah, then trust in His creation. And the first point of trust is those who you're building a halal community with. Trust is key. Backbiting and fitna is only going to destroy us. So as much as you're thinking about what you do when you leave, think about what you're leaving behind on campus. But before we get to leaving behind, think about how you want to live on campus. That's why this talk's called Living and Leaving Behind a Legacy. Because it begins by looking at your own two feet and saying, this is where I'm stood right now. So how do I take the next step? For the sake of Allah. Three things. Whatever you plan to do with your life, Rasulullah said, if you wish to be a warrior, make sure your sword is the sharpest. If you wish to be a farmer, make sure you work the hardest. If you wish to be a blacksmith, make sure you are the strongest with your anvil. The hadith is saying, be a master at what you do. Don't just go for graduation. Push yourselves to be the best. That's your Rasul talking a hadith for Muslim. You come to one of the best universities. You've worked hard to get top marks or to get through. How are you going to use your skills to better the Muslim country or the Muslim community or the household you come from? You have the means. You have the ability. But is that naturally in your plan? Next slide. Because remember, you have the power to do so many amazing things in the community. But you have to believe in yourself and keep pushing yourself. Next slide, please. So again, we have this ayah. يوم أذن تأرضون لا تقفى منكم خافية the reality of life, we're all going to die one day. And so in your plan, you're planning for how you're going to give back. But you're also planning for the reality that only taxes and death are definite. Everything else is a possibility. Everything else is mumkin, except death and taxes. And we worry about the first one more than the second. I'm not trying to be morbid, but death is coming, and it will come. For my friend, it came before he even graduated. There may be someone in this room who will not see the end of graduation. And that's okay. To quote a famous king, I leave the corrupt to go to the uncorruptible. I leave the farness of Allah to go back to the closeness of Allah. The poem goes, you're only going home. But live every day like your last. Question every day like your last. Take every moment and opportunity to hold people to account, to hold yourself to account, to journal your journey. Because every moment is an opportunity and regret starts where? By looking back and thinking, if only I would have said or done. Maybe you don't get the impact that you want, but look for the opportunities to please Allah. For Allah looks for the opportunity to elevate you in your heart and your status. Next slide. When I thought about this talk, I had the mushaf that I, so in COVID my grandfather passed away, it was literally on a video call, COVID was very traumatic, a lot of you were doing your A-levels or doing your prep for uni during COVID, Alf Mabruk that we survived, but we all know somebody who passed away, we all know somebody who will never see our graduation, we all know somebody, some elder, bazurg, khadim, somebody who won't be here, and as I get older, I begin to be aware of people around me that are dying, change is the most natural thing. Even look at the autumn, the leaves disappear. And there's an eye in the Quran that reminds us that even the leaves don't hold their form. Everything is cyclical, except for the linear nature of Allah. He has no beginning and end, because he's the originator. But just like Allah says constantly in the Quran, min as wal ard, look around you at nature, it's telling you something. Change is something not to fear. Change is something to engross. Change is something to welcome. And whether you like it or not, part of you is going to change. But will it change for the better? And even if it doesn't, is it telling you something about new goals to set? This whole experience is going to change you. It's going to grow you. It's going to build you. But have you changed with the will of wanting to please the one that made you? Only a question you can answer. And this ayah is the essence I'm reciting this ayah the moment my grandfather passes away. 
because we have a tradition of reciting, as the Quran says, the Quran and the Prophet said from the book of Ahmad, the hadith, that indeed recite the Quran over the dying. The bit that says over the dead is, is discussed and debated, so I'm not going to go into fiqh. Inna, that famous inna, the ghunna of emphasis from the angel. Inna, this is quite important from your Lord, says Jibreel. Inna, that's where the gunna comes from. Inna nahnu nuhya al-mawta wa naqtabu ma qaddamu wa atharahum wa kulla shay'in ahsaynahu fi imamim mubin. Verily, the reality of life is temporary. We all live, we all die. That's not something to fear, the Quran is saying. But everything is being recorded. Every opportunity you took, every opportunity that you missed, everything you said, and because everything you say has a power. Everything you do has a power. Everything that you say has a power. For the Prophet said, Al-Kalimatu Tayyibatu Sadaqa. Do not underestimate a small thing you say, a small smile that you bring to a person. Sister Farah said something to me once eight years ago, and it's kept me going for the last eight years. She doesn't know the reality of what she has done for me many years ago, and what she's done for countless students. There's certain brothers that I've met on campus that helped me when I was scared as a local kid on my own with all these lovely posh kids around me that have helped me so much that I remember them till this day. Even if you think you're not getting much out of this journey, you never know how you inspire a heart. Ya muqallib al-qulub thabit qalbi la dinik. O possessor, O owner of the hearts, you turn the hearts, not I. You don't know with your smile, with your words, with your banter, with your humor, with who you are, how you turn a heart back to Allah. But also, you represent Islam in whatever way you understand it. You are the alamdar, as we say in Urdu. You are the holder of the Prophet's banner. You are the Bilal's of our time, the Abu Dardas of our time, the Aisha's of our time. You hold the banner of Rasulullah when you wear that hijab, when you wear that beard. But even if you don't, you hold Iman in your hearts, you are holding the flag of Rasulullah, so you represent on campus. Whether you like it or not. Until you reject and do kafara of it, you wear the banner of Rasulullah and all the greats of the past. But this verse comes up. It will be written what was recorded that you did, and it will be written the athar. We have the term athari, which is a type of theology, a literalistic theology. We have the word ahlul athar, which is now the ahlul hadith. But the word athar means the legacy maker. What is the legacy that you're leaving behind? To answer that, you have to set goals about creating a legacy now on campus. And a legacy begins by just being there for another person on campus. By being the one that stops and says, you're lost? Oh, by the way, yeah, Michael Sadler's that way. By the way, something as small as that could lead a person to a lecture that keeps them motivated to finish their degree and go back to where they came from to then do amazing work. Just because you bother to wait. That's part of the urf of a Yorkshireman, of a Yorkshire woman. We stop and we chat. I know the city centre is a bit different, but if you're in Roundy Park or countries like Ilkham or about that, you get it everywhere. People just stop for you. Because time is precious. A moment you give to another person on campus is a moment that could re that person in that moment feels like they're going through hell on earth. But just by stopping, you gave that person hope. Just like Allah Ta'ala is the one who gives hope. We are to fear him and to have hope in him. It's a relationship like a mother and a child. You don't fear your parents. You feel ashamed to let them down. And that Allah doesn't need you. But he wants the best for you. So want the best for yourself. And part of that is not being on it on your own. Not thinking it's all on my shoulders. Knowing that there are people around you. But how can you also be that person that removes the burden from another? For Rasulullah said, Allah Ta'ala has promised me that if you remove the burden of a person in this world, Allah will look at the worst times to remove a burden from you. And we never know when those burdens will come. But we can always create the opportunity to remove a burden from another. For Rasulullah said, do you wish to look for the beauty of Allah? It's a famous hadith. It's the one that they start teaching you when you start in the kulliya. Do you wish to look for the mercy of Allah when you're crying to Allah in your du'as? Look how the hadith finishes. There's another version of the hadith. Do you wish to look for the beauty of Allah, embody beauty. Do you wish to look for the mercy of Allah, embody it. What you want from God, be it for others. In that hadith is our religion in a nutshell. What you want for others, be it yourself. We are a proactive tradition. 
We are a religion of amal, of pillars and principles, of criteria. But we are a religion of being productive and proactive. If you've got time to gossip and time to moan, be part of the solution. Be, don't be problem orientated, be action driven. Because our eye sockers have a lot on their plates and so do you all. But Muslims have a bad habit I found in my professional life of picking up the ladder. I'm the only brown guy in the village, therefore I'm going to get promoted. Let's use the diversity laws. No. You have a responsibility to your Muslim and non-Muslim neighbor to be beautiful with them and to be merciful with them for any chance that Allah Ta'ala could use it as an excuse to elevate your soul. How can you take the opportunity? Next slide. Is everyone okay, by the way? Everyone all right? Doing okay? Yes. He's giving me the mullah look nice, man. Just like Jummah. So, let's bring in something from the Quran. The Imam of the Ummah is Ibrahim alayhi salam. For his banner is the banner of Rasulullah. Abraham says something about you. Yes, right? He says something about you alayhi salam. In this ayah he says, and for time's sake I'll stick to the English. But look out for the word, atamma hunna. Or mention Muhammad to the people, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that we said to Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he is one who was proactive. He was productive. He took the opportunity. Every opportunity he had to fulfill my commandments, he took it. He wasn't scared of how people would look at him. And Ibrahim was mocked. Nu was knocked. Read the stories of prophets. They were often laughed at and mocked at and given Islamophobia long before we coined that term. You walk in the footsteps of prophets when you feel uneasy about how people are going to judge you. But do as the prophets did. It's not about holding that fear. It's about beginning to let it go when you're productive and proactive with it. Ibrahim says, Oh Allah, you have said that you've made me a leader. What about my descendants? The thing there is, Ibrahim is being called Imam, leader of the creation, and he's, own, and he's bothered about how he can see the next generation. He's crying about the next generation. A true leader is he or she that thinks about how their actions impact those to come and how their skills can empower those to come how can you use your skills and your personalities i'll say it again to help the next gen your rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he doesn't need to do tawbah for allah ta'ala has made him nabi it's from the qualities of a prophet they cannot be a liar or a troublemaker or they don't deserve the message prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to cry for you and me every night saying oh allah forgive me and forgive my ummah because he wanted the best for the future. And that drove him with everything he did in his sunnah to think about how he would then see you. O oh, people of Hind, O oh, people of Kuwait, O oh, people of Pakistan, O oh, Brits. Do you think the Sahaba could have imagined that people in the middle of a village called Liodis, which would then become Leeds, would become leaders in the Muslim world? And yet it's happening. And you are a continuation of the du'as of the prophets. You are a continuation of the smile of Abraham. You are a continuation of the tears of Rasulullah because you deserve it. Walk like them. You cannot be them, but walk as they walk in the decisions that you make. And what unites us and the prophets? We hold Allah in the decisions that we make. Next slide. Right. So again, let's go back to what do we mean by legacy? What is athar? To quote Sheikh Tahir, who himself was a master's and PhD student from this university, and mashallah, he is one of the local shayuk that you can go to, um, who has a lot of love, makes a lot of dua for the community at Leeds University. I was with him the other day, and he sends salam to all of you. Know that that masjid, and Makkah masjid, and all the masajids around, are here for you as much as the green room and the ISOC are. And it's your right to demand and to ask for things, because you are part of the community of Leeds. I'm a local, I'm an Ansar, and you are Muhajireen, many of you. You have a right over us. Okay, Bradford, we included you as well. But you're not really Ansar, you're just part of the Ummah. They're like, basically, it goes to Pudzi, and then it's Bradford Sharif, and it's like, yeah, with the same... It, it gets a bit muddy when you live in Pudzi. Where does Bradford start and Leeds finish? So, we're all Ansar. We're all your Khadimin here. We're here for you. Next slide. That verse was talking about being a seed. There is something that you will do on campus that will be a seed that you drop. My grandfather grew a mango tree a few years ago. And he, and he, and he said to my khala, my auntie, I will not be alive to see this tree blossom with mangoes. 
but you will. And so when he passed away, he was stood, she was, my aunt was stood on the phone to me saying, Adam, your grandfather said to me, look, the mangoes have grown. This is Pakistan, the village of Samundri where my ancestors are from. And she said, look, your granddad cried about these mangoes, that he would plant this tree, but he knew he would never enjoy the fruits. But he knew that it would make me smile and, it, and the children that play around it smile after he's long gone. You are planting seeds on campus. You are learning skills to then plant seeds in your own lives. Maybe you will not see the fruits. Maybe it takes a couple of generations. But who's going to be smiling at your mangoes? Who's going to be smiling at your fruits? Who's going to be smiling at the impact of the amazing things you can do if you believe in yourself and trust in Allah? We don't do good things. We don't take opportunities to enjoy the fruits. That's not the way of the Sahaba and the Ansar and the Muslimun. We don't care about the fruits. We care about the vision. And we care about doing and working. Because if we don't get to taste the fruits, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to taste it in the next world. Aisha was sat with a poor woman once, radiallahu anha, and she said, this grape in my hand, O sister. al yadul uliya khayrun ala yadul safar. The one who gives is always in a greater position than the one who takes. The one who takes the opportunity to maximize the world we're living in, to maximize the opportunities from Allah, is a believer who's pushing themselves, a doer, not just a talker. And that's what our religion guides us to do, to be people of action, not just people of conversation. And we do a bit too much of that as people. And I'm reflecting on myself. And you'll get lots of that. It's cool to sit in a shisha bar or a lounge and Omar knows my opinions of such places. It's become normal for us to sit on campus, sit in libraries, sit in the union, and just gossip. It's fun. Yeah? It's fun to sit and gossip, right? I'm not going to kid you. It's fun for the body. It's poison to the soul. Because the soul is free. It's larger than the body it's contained in. It's made of light and beauty. And it comes from a realm without control. So it's trapped. A dunya sijnal muslim ujinatul kafir, the Prophet said. The world is a prison for a true believer, but it's heaven for the disbeliever who doesn't reflect on their own soul. So taking care of that soul begins with taking care of this, having vision and having drive. Next slide. So lessons from the past. I just wanted to quickly introduce something that I started to look into at university. This is my grandparents. They came here in the 60s. Leeds became a university in 1904. The first Muslims came from Malaya and India, Muslim students in the early 1920s. I read about a man called Muhammad Amin who came and did engineering in 26. You are part of a long tradition of Muslims on campus. But my grandparents were illiterate. So illiterate that my grandmother, Rahmatullah Ta'ala, didn't even know how to sign her own name. She had to put a print because she couldn't write or write. And her dream was that her children and her grandchildren would. Her words in Punjabi were, and I won't say it for those of us for a breadth of time, I wish to see a generation who do not have to be Punjabi. Yeah, for those of you who thought I'm Arab, I'm not. I'm Qatar Punjabi me. Andy? So the fact he said that in Urdu is quite funny. I got to know Punjabi the witch bolna to see bolu ye thiye yar. Chak de patte. Hi 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 hi. Kya baat hai? Oh yeah. Uh, I also understand Mirpuri as well. Allah to all the Kashmiri brothers. There's a lot of love between Muslims that have been living here. And to all of you internationals or externals, there's a lot of love in this city. But there's a lot of division as well. There's a lot of sectarianism. And that's not your problem. But believe it or not, our head brother was saying, one of the campaigns he has is what Ustada Farah has been saying for eight years, connecting you with the city. Don't just be trapped in the bubble of campus. Your life is not just the library and home. Al Ghazali would probably say, if library and home is what's going to protect your iman, stick to that. But those of you who want to do bigger and better, there is a community around you. So much volunteering away. We've got our amazing um, sister, uh, mashallah, sister Haryati, who I teach. I'm, I'm the youth worker for her son, and she's still in the union. Good to have friends in high places, isn't it? You know, it's good to have those connections. An amazing sister who's trying to push policy around Islamophobia on campus and Muslim rights. She and her team in the union, and I'm not, I'm not a poster boy for the union, I'm an external. It's people like me they need to keep out. But go to her. The union's a more friendlier place than it was eight years ago. There's some of my old friends like Brother Zaki up there. 
Those people whose pictures you see when you're walking on the left are people that used to be the ISOC. What, what imprint will you leave behind? I was looking at my grandparents the last two years and my mental health got really bad when they passed away because, like I said, my grandma died at a time when it was very difficult for my mum. And I always held on to the love of my grandfather because he was my teacher and mentor for the first seven years of my life. And even though we didn't speak for 20 years, the next time I was with him, I was reciting the ayah of Imam al-Mubin to him on the phone. And then I was teaching my relatives to wash his body. And I was washing his body. And that for me was a profound experience. But it just goes to show, I remember once, my grandfather's driving to Tarawih, and he stops to give me a lift, and I, being a stubborn 14 year old, goes, no. Nope. Mum wouldn't like that. I have regretted that moment my whole life. That just for three minutes I would have been sat in a car with my grandfather. And I could have said something. And now I will regret it to the day I die. But We're going to have moments that we regret. Moments that we look back at. Moments where it's just too awkward to do anything. Moments where you introverts in the room are like, uh, I don't know what to do, it's just me. And you extroverts, me and my big mouth. Allah Ta'ala made you laqad khalaqna insana fi ahsani. He made you beautiful the way you are. When you deny that, you deny yourself. When you deny yourself, you open the door to shaitan. That's why it's so important, brothers and sisters, that you set your goals and make them manageable. You set your goals, but know that you're not alone. Next slide, please. We're going to quickly go through this. That's granddad, by the way. I was, um, I was blackmailed by my mother to put this picture in, so I do apologize in advance. Because I'm an insan just like you. Just because I wear a turban, and just because I have Sharia studies behind me and I've traveled, makes me no different to any of you. That's what I wanted to get across in this, in, in this talk, as well as welcoming you here. Some of us may not be very scholarly or knowledgeable, but remember, the first in the hellfire from the believers is the scholar, then the warrior, then the rich man. Because they're people who outwardly, they look like they're doing things for the betterment of others. But they care about grabbing the mango. They care about tasting its fruit. They care about benefiting from what they do. A true seeker of knowledge is every single one of you. A true warrior who fights their mental health every day, who fights to be a Muslim on campus every day, is a person who just keeps on going because they believe it's the right thing to do. And a true person gives back when they know that they have empowered themselves enough to then give back, like the Tajir, who may be rich, and he's making lots of money. But then when there's a customer that comes to you saying, I don't have enough, but I've got my kids to feed. You don't care that you made a loss. For you, that's a profit because it was an opportunity to grow. Next slide. Next slide again. So again, for me, if I allowed the traumas in my life to get in the way, if I allowed the worries and concerns in my life to get in the way, I wouldn't have done all the things that I do. Whilst at university, I traveled to all these places. I worked in Malaysia, Indonesia. I worked for the embassy. I was an English teacher. I spent time in Morocco and Palestine trying to build my deen. I tried to learn Arabic and Bahasa and Persian and Urdu. I tried to connect with my own culture as well as my own deen. But I had good people around me. And my intention was always, Ya Allah, if any of this, the hadith, the dua of Rasulullah, the haja of Rasulullah, Oh Allah, in any goal I set, if it is best that I don't, let me fail. But if it is good for me, let me excel. Make that dua every day with everything that you do. If what I'm doing, the goal I've set is good for me, help me to become the best. And if it ain't good for me, I put my trust in you. Next slide. This is some of the community of Muslims that lived here in the 20s, 30s and 40s. When you go out to the Pakistan steppes, the original Hair Hills, the original BD3 in my opinion, although Bradford had a big community in the 40s and 50s with Muslims, you'd be surprised. This university was a place where Umar House, which is just as you go towards um, All Hallows Church, there's a house on the corner, the original Grand Mosque. This is Movi Shutaria, a Gujarati teacher. He used to come to campus begging for a prayer hall. The first masjid in Leeds is in Chapel Town. It's an old Jewish synagogue. That started because a group of friends, Pakistanis and Gujaratis, Indians came together on campus and set up the Pakistani Muslim Society Welfare. It's a bit long. But it was just a group of friends meeting up on the Parkinson steps. The history of Islam in this city is interconnected with students on campus connecting with the city as a whole. 
the first masjid, the first funeral home. One of the first janazas was done in one of the gardens at the university. But these are stories for another day. These people you never know. These people you've not heard of. But there are people that helped to set up the green room only 20 years ago. There are people whose names you've never heard that set up the Islamic society, that made sure that there were halal options. And there is a lot of work to do. Ustad al is doing a lot of work. But how are you going to contribute to the next generation? You don't even realize the fact that you as a Muslim on campus, through policy, through options, there was a generation that were growing the trees of what you're now tasting. You're tasting the mangoes of the ummah that struggled before you, that left a legacy. What will be the mangoes and the fruits that people will be tasting from your hard works when you graduate and leave? That is something to look forward to. So we're going to go one slide forward. And we're going to go, this is just how cool the Muslims are. So that's the first masjid, by the way, on the left there. Aren't they so cute? Three people in there, their children have become councillors and members and MPs for this city, by the way. You are in a very important place because it's been a place of unity for the early Muslims in ways. And maybe that's a talk in itself for another time. But let's move on. Move on. You can find out more about the history of Muslims in Leeds by looking out for this, inshallah, or getting in touch with me. Moving on. Moving on. Right. I'm going to finish with this. Can we go to the next slide? Please. So, let's go back. I was a student like you on campus in 2014. And I had been sitting with ulama since I was eight. I went to a kulia to study the Islamic sciences when I was 12, 30, in the holy city of Bradford, in Manningham Sharif. Manningham. By the way, for the fact, our Ustada is also from Bradford, so I've got to behave myself. Mafiji, yeah? I'm so in trouble. I'm so in trouble. I'm so in trouble. But to finish with, let's go back. Let's go back. I started when I said, we are all at different levels. We are all at different levels when we come to study here. We're all at different levels with our spirituality. We're all on different pages in our journey to be a Muslim on campus. That's okay. It's okay not to be okay when your mental health is at a different level. It's okay to have doubts. I came to uni having nine years of study in the Islamic sciences and having to deal with some horrible doubts. And I got scared and then all the Islamophobia was happening. And I remember meeting Ustad Andrew Busso on campus. He used to come to the Parkinson steps upstairs on the left where the ISOT used to do a lot of their events. You can Google uh, history of uh, Islam Black History of Islam, and Dr. Tajil from the Islamic Studies Department does a talk in that room. I remember going up to the Ustad and being like, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I've got doubts. Doubts from the Sira. I've got doubts about God. I've got doubts about myself. I'm struggling. And I expected him to judge me and to tell me, fear Allah, like I'd been told in the masjid. One of the beautiful things about campus is, not only do you meet people who judge you, or people that bring a different perspective, but you meet people who come from completely different traditions to you. That isn't something to fear. Because we all are on a journey. And one gift, one pearl, one story from your life could be the trajectory to help a person on their journey. So be open, be honest, have integrity. Know that your ISOC is there for you. Ustad Andrew, when I said to him, I've got doubts about the Prophet Muhammad, he introduced me to Jonathan A.C. Brown. I said to him, I've got issues with the leadership and the hierarchy in my masjid. I don't like all this hypocrisy in our community. He said, read about community and activism, the works of Dr. Muhammad Hakim. I talked about my mental health. And he said, by the way, I could give you this book, Trials and Tribulations in Islamic Perspective. But I am just here. You have chaplains on campus. You have friends around you. The Prophet of Allah said, you are the friends that you keep. Because on the day of Yom Qiyamah, you'll be standing next to the people that your heart adored. As opposed to you saying, I believe in Rasulullah, I believe in the Ummah, your heart will speak. And the Productive Muslim, a book about being proactive and productive. Anything on campus that takes you away from being productive, any backbiting, any kalam, any this is juicy, any difficulty, any division. If it's not productive for me and my soul, keep away from it. 
But if you can contribute a solution to your ISOC or your community or the experiences of others, only then get involved. On that, I'm going to finish. If we could go right to the last slide, please. So click, 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 click. Oh, we're here. Mashallah, we're here. So I call you Koli Hada, I stuck for Ruka, I told you Lay, welcome to the Saru Sahin. My email is there. I'm just a local nobody who likes to do things for the campus because it was there for me. And in my story, I ended up leaving Leeds University and going elsewhere, which is a story for another day. It literally broke my heart. It broke my heart to move away from the university, and it was one of the biggest gifts to be invited back. You'll see me on Jamaz, you'll see me in the lunch group that we have in the Riley Smith. And if not, you can always grab Umar, inshallah, or our president. If no one else tells you that they're here for you, Ustad al is here for you. I'm here for you. There are people like Haryati in the union that are here for you. But also be here for each other. I could have given a long checklist about what it means to be a Muslim on campus. Know that it's okay to have bad days with your Iman. Know that it's okay to have days when you just want to give up. But surround yourself with people that remind you, A, how amazing you are. B, how important Allah is and how Allah expects you to be the best version of yourself. And keep journaling your journey. You never know how these moments of pain may be moments of hope for someone else when you least expect it. I wish you, but we don't wish. I put my tawakkul on Allah and I say, I'm looking at the future in this room. You are the future sisters, you are the future brothers. Even if it isn't in a big way, you're the future for one person with one thing that you say or do. How are you going to plant the seed? It begins with a clean heart, an open personality, Allah in your decision making, and good, and good company moving forward. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الألي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المنصلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته And then you got some brothers and sisters there. Haram! Clapping! Haram! Remember, we're all at different levels. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you. Takbir! 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 Allah Ta'ala bless you all. Jazakallah khair.